So I thought to begin our series on cardiac uh, anatomy and cardiac physiology, I thought I'd do a very quick video just looking at the basics of the heart. So in order to understand the basics of the heart, you need to realize that the heart is just a pump, okay? Now, that means that when the heart contracts, it will force blood due to its muscular contraction out and will pump it somewhere in the body. Now you'll find that when we look at the heart that it's actually split into two sides. You have a left heart or a left side of the heart or a right heart, right hand side of the heart. And you'll find that the left hand side of the heart deals with oxygenated blood and the right hand side of the heart deals with deoxygenated blood. Okay? When that left hand side of the heart contracts, it pushes the blood out and feeds the tissues of the body. And that's our systemic circulation. When the right hand side of the heart, which has deoxygenated blood in it, when that contracts, it pushes the blood to the lungs to become oxygenated, and that's the pulmonary circulation. And we'll talk more about this in future videos. But first, let's have a look and see how this blood flow all works. So I like to start off and very, very simply draw what you'd picture to be some cartoonish drawing of the heart. All right. That's basically what we all imagine. Now, obviously it doesn't look like that. Obviously it doesn't look that upright. If you were to picture the heart, you would more so draw it like that. Now, approximately it's the size of your fist. You'd put it at your sternum level, except you'd move it a little bit to the left, and then you'd twist your fist so that the line of your knuckles are pointing towards your left hip you find that the heart, as you can see, has a point at the bottom, which we call the apex. And that apex of your heart is pointing towards your left hip. If you wanted to know where that apex sat, it actually sits just on top of your diaphragm. And if you take your two fingers, and if you know how to count your ribs, you can go to your fifth rib, and then the space below that, which is the fifth intercostal space towards the left hand side of your sternum. So basically it's underneath your left portion of your chest and you can feel that fifth intercostal space. And if you just take a second, you should be able to feel the apex of your heart contract. And that's that fifth intercostal space. So that's just letting you know where the heart is actually sitting in regards to your chest. But what I wanna to do today is just focus on this cartoonish picture of the heart. Now, when we have a look at the heart, we know that inside the heart it has four chambers. So what you can simply do is just separate the heart like that. And these four chambers, you can see you've got two at the top and two below, okay? Now the chambers at the top, they are called atria, or individually they are an atrium. Atrium, atrium. Now, remember that when we look at these types of diagrams, we need to know which way is left, which way is right, okay? Now, patient left is going to be over here, patient right is going to be over here, so this is the left atrium, that's the right atrium. Now, below the atrium, we have ventricles. We have a left ventricle and a right. Ventricle. Easy. You need to know that blood will always flow from atria to ventricles. Okay? So blood will always go down. Now, you need to also remember that, and I might as well draw this one as blue, and the reason why is because as I stated at the start, the right hand side of the heart deals with deoxygenated blood. So let's draw that as blue. Even though blood that's deoxygenated is not blue, it's just a different shade of red. But we draw it like that anyway. So, both atria, blood will always enter the heart to the atria. Okay? Always. So what you can draw then is a blood vessel like that. And a blood vessel like that. Easy. And blood will always exit by the ventricles. So you can draw two more. Okay, easy. Now, any time a vessel goes towards the heart, it's called a vein. Any time a vessel goes away from the heart, 
It's called an artery. So these two are arteries moving away from the heart, these two are veins moving towards the heart. Now, when you see this red blood, you can see that it's oxygenated. Now, where do we get our oxygen from? From our lungs, which means that this blood is coming from somewhere that's given it oxygen so that it can then go out, which means that this vessel right here going towards the left atrium has just come from the lungs. Easy. Which means that the lungs has given this blood oxygen, the blood comes back to the left atrium. Now if you want to know the name of this vessel, it's easy. Remember that it is a vein, okay, so vein's going to be in the name, and it's come from the lungs, and when we look at the lungs, or refer to the lungs, we often use the word pulmonary. So this is called the pulmonary vein. Pulmonary vein. So the pulmonary vein carries oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium. That left atrium will contract, push blood into the left ventricle. That left ventricle will contract and push blood out, which means this is an artery. Now, if it's oxygenated blood, where do you think it needs to go? It needs to go to parts of the body that require oxygen, which is everywhere. So this vessel ultimately will send this oxygenated blood to all the tissues of the body. So what you can do is you can write body. You can draw this vessel coming down like that. Okay, what's the name of this vessel? This vessel is called the aorta. And it takes oxygenated blood to the body. Now, once this blood has made it to the tissues of the body, it will hand it some oxygen, also hand it some nutrients, glucose, so forth. And it will take from those tissues carbon dioxide and metabolic waste which means that the blood on the other side here is deoxygenated, right? Because it's just handed all that oxygen away. Now, once this blood is deoxygenated and has carbon dioxide and has metabolic waste products, there's no point delivering it to the tissues of the body because they just don't need it. So we need to take this somewhere. Where do we take it? Well, we take it back to the heart. So you can draw this blood vessel coming back up to the heart. And because it's coming back to the heart, it's a vein, and we call it vena cava. So this blood vessel is called the vena cava. Easy. Now, once this deoxygenated blood via the vena cava returns to the right atrium, right atrium contracts, pushes blood to the right ventricle, and the right ventricle, what does it do with this deoxygenated blood? Well, it has no oxygen, but it's got CO2. That's pointless for our tissues. We need to do something with it. We need to get rid of the CO2 and take, and take oxygen and bring it into the blood. So how do we do that? Well, we need to send it to the lungs. So when the right ventricle contracts, it brings this blood up and sends it to the lungs. Here at the lungs, it will give away the carbon dioxide and take the oxygen and then the whole pathway begins again. This vessel going from the right ventricle to the lungs, remember, it's going away from the heart. Think of the A in away, means it's an artery. And this artery is going to the lungs, which I said we use the word pulmonary. So this is the pulmonary artery. Simple. So, I recommend before you start drawing more difficult, more complex pictures of the heart, which we'll do in future videos, I suggest you just draw very basic images of the heart and just start to label the major or the great vessels associated with it and the respective atrium and ventricles. In the next video, we're going to have a look at sectioning the heart and we'll look at some of the internal anatomy of the heart. And also in another video, we're going to look at more complex external anatomical landmarks, such as the anterior and posterior portions of the heart. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to draw a more detailed diagram of the heart and also label some more details which we didn't go through in that very simple, basic heart anatomy video that I just uploaded previously. So let's first have a look. Remember, heart is broken up into left-hand side, right-hand side of the heart. 
I want you to picture that we've taken a heart and we've coronally sectioned it so that we've revealed the four chambers inside. That's how we're going to be drawing the heart today. So let's first of all start off with the right hand side of the heart. So you know that you're going to have an inferior and a superior vena cava and the inferior and superior vena cava connect with the right atrium. And the right atrium, you know, pushes blood through to the right ventricle. And that right ventricle pushes blood up through the pulmonary artery. And this pulmonary artery bifurcates, splits into two, to go to the left and right lung, respectively. Okay? If we look at the left-hand side of the heart, what we can draw, first of all, is the left atrium. Then we can draw the left ventricle. And we can draw the aorta coming off. And the aorta, you're going to see, is going to go around. And in front, the pulmonary artery. And as it starts to move across like this, you're going to find that there's three superior branches of the aorta, which we'll talk about shortly, coming off. We can draw like that. All right. Now, there's just one more thing we haven't drawn. We haven't drawn any of the vessels, so the veins that are coming in to the left atrium, and I'll draw that in a second. What I want to first of all draw is the muscle that lines the heart. So if we were to draw some of the muscle that lines the heart, and what you're going to find first of all is that if we have a look at the muscle, so the myocardium, which is the heart muscle, for the ventricles, you're going to find that the thickness of the left ventricular myocardium is about three times thicker than the left ventricular myocardium. And I want you to think why that's the case, because this left ventricle, when it contracts, it pushes blood up into the aorta and that goes to the whole body. So it needs to be under high pressure. The right ventricle, when it contracts, where's it pushing the blood to? It pushes it through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Not very far away, so it's not a high pressure system. The left hand side of the heart, high pressure system. Right hand side of the heart, low pressure system. And in my blood pressure video, I'll talk about this in more detail. Okay, now, let's draw up some very basic lungs either side. So there's left lung, there's the right lung, and what we're going to draw now are the final blood vessels that come from the lungs to the left atrium, okay? So I'm going to draw these in red, so there's two there from the left lung. and two here from the right lung. So what you can see is that with these veins, these pulmonary veins, we have four pulmonary veins, okay? So let's write a little list, first of all. What you're gonna find is we have, if we start with the deoxygenated blood that's coming back from the body, if it comes back to the heart, so remember right hand side of the heart, if the deoxygenated blood comes back to the right hand side of the heart from above the heart, it comes down via the superior vena cava. If it's coming back to the heart from below, it comes via the inferior vena cava. So let's write this as step one. Deoxygenated blood is coming back. So let's write it down here. One vena now just remember, we could start one anywhere. 
because it's a circuit. It goes all the way back around. So we're just starting with deoxygenated blood at the vena cava. This deoxygenated blood comes in to the right atrium, which is going to be step two. Right atrium. Okay, that right atrium contracts and pushes blood into the left, into the right, sorry, ventricle. Now, point three is not the right ventricle because the blood must move through a set of valves. Okay, these valves, just like any other valves, are one way. So these valves separate the right atrium from the right ventricle, and you can see that they open down like this. So the blood can move from the right atrium down into the right ventricle. They open up. When that right ventricle contracts and makes a lot of pressure, all this blood pushes up and closes these valves. Now, the valves on the right hand side of the heart, which I'm going to write here as number three, these valves that separate the right atrium from the right ventricle are called the tricuspid valves. Tricuspid valve. Okay, then it moves into the right ventricle. And then that right ventricle contracts and pushes blood up into the pulmonary artery. But before it goes through the pulmonary artery, it has to go through another set of valves. So I'm going to put five here, indicating this set of valves. Okay. Now this set of valves here are called semilunar valves and that's because they look like little crescents, little crescent moons, okay, semilunar. Now you'll find that there's three of these little crescents placed here within the pulmonary artery. If you look down into the pulmonary artery, they look like little nets because when the right ventricle contracts and pushes blood up under Contraction pushes blood up through these valves. When the heart relaxes, the blood wants to come back down. We do not want the blood to come back into the right ventricle, so these valves catch it like a net, and they are the semi-lunar valves. But because they're on the right-hand side, they're the pulmonary semi-lunar valves. Okay, then that blood moves through into the pulmonary artery. Now this is the pulmonary trunk and you can see the pulmonary trunk bifurcates, meaning it splits off into two pulmonary arteries. So we can write six pulmonary trunk and then we can write seven pulmonary arteries. Okay, now the pulmonary arteries are going to push this deoxygenated blood to the lungs, which is number eight. Now, you know that this blood has no oxygen, but it does have carbon dioxide, which means that as this blood gets to the lungs, gives the lungs carbon dioxide, takes oxygen, okay? Which means now this blood becomes oxygenated and has to come back to the heart becomes oxygenated, has to come back to the heart. And how does it come back? Well, it always comes back to the heart via veins, leaves the heart via arteries, back to the heart via veins. Because they're the lungs, they're going to be called the pulmonary veins. And you can see there are four, one, two, three, four pulmonary veins. So this is step nine. Pulmonary veins. Okay, now, this oxygenated blood enters the left atrium. This is going to be step 10, left atrium. Left atrium will contract and push blood through into the left ventricle, but it must move through another valve 
similar valve to what's on the right hand side so not the tricuspid over here it's called the bicuspid or the mitral valve bicuspid or mitral okay then it moves through so that's going to be 11 moves through to the left ventricle which is 12 Then that left ventricle contracts, all that thick myocardium of the left ventricle contracts and forces the blood up into the aorta. However, just like when the right ventricle contracted and pushed the blood into the pulmonary artery, it has to go through valves. And again, there's semilunar valves, pulmonary semilunar, aortic semilunar. So number 13 are the aortic semilunar valves. Okay, then it moves into the aorta. And that aorta will start to branch and branch and branch. The, aorta's gonna, the aorta sorry, is going to branch so many times that it goes from this being this big, thick, elastic artery to smaller, smaller arteries and smaller, smaller arterioles, which are less elastic but more muscular, and then they branch even further into capillary beds, where at the capillary beds, the different tissues get fed. They get the oxygen, they get the glucose, and then what happens? It comes back to the heart via the inferior, superior vena cava. Now these three little outlets here, I'll talk about in a future video where I highlight some of the most important arteries and veins of the body. But just know that at the moment, they are just branches of the aorta, taking the blood somewhere that needs to be fed. So hopefully this is something that you can draw by yourself and helps you label the important anatomical features of the heart. Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. I want to talk about the heart muscle that we call the myocardium. Myo means muscle, cardium is referring to heart. And what you can see is the heart muscle varies in width all throughout the heart. Specifically when we look at the ventricles. So the ventricles are the two bottom chambers of the heart. When they contract, or I should say, when the myocardium that surrounds these hollow chambers contract. So there's the left ventricle, there's the right ventricle. You can see I've performed a transverse section through this heart. When they contract, they push blood out of the heart. Now, the left ventricle pushes that blood out via the aorta, and the right ventricle pushes that blood out via the pulmonary arteries. Now, what you can see here is the left ventricle and the right ventricle myocardium, heart muscle, varies in thickness. Now, the question is why do they vary in thickness? And the answer is because when that right ventricle contracts, it simply needs to push blood either side, that is, to the lungs. So it doesn't require a lot of pressure, it doesn't require a lot of force. But when that left ventricle or myocardium of the left ventricle contracts, it needs to push blood out to the entire body. That's the top of the head to the tip of the toes. And that means it requires a lot of pressure and that's a lot of force. And in order to do that, we need a lot of muscle. And that muscle contracts, it squeezes like a tube of toothpaste. It actually begins at the bottom and squeezes upwards and then it squirts that blood out by the aorta to the entire body. This is important clinically because if somebody has a myocardial heart muscle infarction, death, that results in death of the myocardium. And it can happen anywhere throughout this myocardium. Predominantly happens at the ventricles because they push blood out to the body. So we get the most, notable, most um, noticeable effects there. And think about it, if the death of the heart muscle happens on the left-hand side, it's predominantly gonna have the worst effects because it means that heart muscle can't contract to deliver blood to the whole body. Person dies very quickly. And the right-hand side, if it happens, well, it doesn't need to generate a huge amount of force to send that blood to the lungs. So the left-hand side seems to be the most deadly side when it comes to a myocardial infarction. And when this heart muscle dies, it can just be a little bit of the heart muscle or it can go the entire width of the heart muscle. That's called transmural. If it goes through the entire width of the heart muscle or just a part of it, you can notice these changes on an ECG, also known as an EKG an electrocardiogram. So this is a quick run through of heart muscle.
Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna look at surface anatomy relating to the heart and also heart sounds, that lub-dub, lub-dub that we often refer to. So first thing is, we know that our heart sits within our chest, specifically an area termed the mediastinum, and it sits behind our rib cage, behind our sternum, and we have our lungs either side. Now, if you take your fist, place it at your sternum, then shift it a little bit towards the left, and then tilt your fist so that you can draw a straight line down your knuckles to your left hip. That's approximately the size and placement of your heart within your chest. Now, what you can see is the top of the heart, what we term the base, funnily enough, that sits at around about the second rib, and the apex or the pointy bottom that's pointing towards your left hip, that sits at around about the fifth intercostal space. Now, if you wanna find this fifth intercostal space, what you can do is go mid-clavicular, get your left clavicle, go midline down, midline across, move down towards your nipple, and as you get to your nipple, mid-clavicular, feel the first intercostal space. This is the first space between your ribs just below your nipple. This is approximately the fifth intercostal space, and if you were to just pause and feel that, you should be able to feel your heart at that fifth intercostal space. That's because the apex of your heart is beating against your chest wall. So the base sits at the second rib approximately and the apex sits at the fifth intercostal space. All right, now what I've drawn up here is that heart sitting within the rib cage. Now what I've actually done is move the heart to sit more superficially so it sits outside the rib cage, but we know that the heart sits within and the sternum is protecting predominantly the heart and you've got the ribs as well, here's the clavicle, or clavicles I should say. All right, a couple of things. I wanna refer back to the valves of the heart. Remember that you have two atria of the heart at the top, two ventricles down the bottom. Blood always enters the atria, and then the atria contract, push blood down into the ventricles. The ventricles contract, push blood out of the heart. Now in order for blood to move from the atria to the ventricles, they need to move through valves. Either side, the right hand side from the atria to the ventricles have valves, the left hand side has atria and ventricles, okay, and valves in between. If we look at the right hand side, going from the right atrium to the right ventricle, the valve it moves through is something called a tricuspid valve. Now the tricuspid valve is this valve right here, and like I said, you're moving blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. This is deoxygenated blood. Now on the left hand side, we've got blood moving from the left atrium to the left ventricle through another valve called the bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral valve, and this is the mitral valve here. Left ventricle, uh, left atrium, through the valve, left ventricle. All right, so these are those two valves that we term the atrioventricular valves because they sit between the atrium and the ventricles. Now we need to talk about another set of valves called the semilunar valves. Now when those ventricles contract, when the right ventricle contracts, it pushes blood out of the heart to the lungs via the pulmonary artery, and the pulmonary artery, more specifically the trunk, has a valve there called the semilunar valve. It's called the pulmonary semilunar valve, okay? Now the pulmonary semilunar valve, you can see is sitting right here. So when that right ventricle contracts, it pushes blood up to go to these pulmonary arteries through the pulmonary valve, all right? Pulmonary semilunar valve. Now on the left-hand side, when blood goes from the left ventricle out through the aorta, it needs to go through a valve, semilunar valve, the aortic semilunar valve, and that's this one right here. Okay, why am I telling you about these valves? It's because you can see where they sit predominantly, and they sit predominantly behind the sternum, okay? Now this is important clinically because sometimes we need to listen to heart sounds. Why? Because there's two predominant heart sounds, that lub-dub, 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 two. The lub is termed the first heart sound, and what happens is this. As blood goes from the atria to the ventricles, blood moves through the atrioventricular valves, then the ventricles contract, right, and those valves are closed, and blood, turbulent blood, dynamic blood, moving blood, hits those closed doors, the closed atrioventricular valve doors, which means the first heart sound is due to closure of the atrioventricular valves. So when you listen to the first heart sound, Auscultation is the term that we use for listening. So when you listen to these heart sounds and you listen to S1, you're listening to whether there's any murmurs associated with closure of the AV valves. Perfect. The second heart sound, the dub, is when the blood moves from the ventricles out of the respective arteries, whether it's the pulmonary arteries or whether it's the aorta, has to go through the pulmonary semilunar valve and the aortic semilunar valve. And as it moves through, they then close. And as the blood wants to come back in, the blood hits the wall, turbulent blood hits the closed doors, 
therefore the second heart sound, the dub, is due to closure of the semilunar valves. All right, and again, auscultation of these valves can tell you whether there's a problem. Or a murmur, a murmur is simply disrupted turbulence of blood through the heart. Now, because they sit behind the sternum, it's difficult to listen to because it's muffling that sound, it's blocking it. But there's other parts of the heart we can listen to, to hear those valves. This is what this part of the lecture is about. So, if you wanna to listen to the mitral valve, that's the valve that separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. Instead of going here behind the sternum, you can go to the apex of the heart. And I told you the apex of the heart sits at the fifth intercostal space on the left hand side, right there, perfect. If you wanna to listen to the tricuspid valve, you can stay at that fifth intercostal space, move more medially towards the middle, and you'll be able to hear the tricuspid valve. What about the semilunar valves? Well, the base of the heart sits at the second rib. If you go to the second intercostal space, on the left-hand side, you should be able to hear the pulmonary. On the right-hand side, you should be able to hear the aortic. So, this is surface anatomy relating to the heart, and this is the heart sounds as well. In this video, we're gonna look at the coronary arteries. So remember, the heart, as a muscle, it may contract and pump blood around the body and the lungs to feed it, give it oxygen, give it nutrients, but remember, the heart itself needs oxygen and nutrients, and it gets it via the coronary arteries. So that means the heart does not just pull oxygen and nutrients from within, it actually needs its own dedicated blood supply. Again, these are the coronary arteries. Now there's two major branches of coronary arteries. There's the left and right coronary arteries, and you can see that both of them come out at the trunk of the aorta. Here's the aorta here, those three superior branches coming off, and you can see that you've got the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery coming out. Now the important point is when the left ventricle contracts and pushes blood out via the aorta, when that left ventricle re relaxes, called diastole, systole is contraction, pushing blood out, relaxation is diastole, in relaxation, when the heart relaxes, the blood wants to fall back down, but it gets caught by what we call the aortic semilunar valves. Now, when the blood gets caught in the aortic semilunar valves, that's when the blood drains out via these coronary arteries. This is important because it's very different to the way other vessels feed tissues. They feed them under systole. Here, the heart is being fed under diastole. Now, as the left and right coronary arteries are receiving blood, let's just focus on the left coronary artery, okay? Now, what we can see is the left, let's label this, we've got the left coronary artery, and the left coronary artery continues down, and as you can see, there is the first major branch that comes off at the front. Now, this front branch, an anterior branch, descends down, and this anterior descending coronary artery, which is what it's called, goes down the interventricular septum. Now this is a septum, this is an area that separates the left ventricle area from the right ventricle area, hence being the interventricular septum. In actual fact, you've got the two atria, two ventricles, you've got the atrioventricular septum down here, also known as the atrioventricular sulcus, and you can see that both the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery moves down the atrioventricular sulcus. Now, with the left coronary artery, we've got that first anterior descending branch that goes down the interventricular septum, and it's called the left anterior descending coronary artery. Let's label that, it's called the left anterior descending coronary artery, the LAD. Let's write the full word out, left anterior descending coronary artery, also known as the anterior descending coronary artery, or the anterior interventricular coronary artery. I know there's a lot of names, but it's okay. Just remember the LAD, left anterior descending. As we can, and I'll tell you what it feeds in a second. Now, as we keep going down the left coronary artery, we spoke about that first branch. That first left anterior descending, you can see, goes all the way down to the apex of the heart and then moves behind the heart. You can see that the lad moves behind the heart and feeds the majority of the interventricular septum and the majority of the left-hand side, the left atrium and left ventricles, the muscle of that left-hand side. So the lad is very important. As we continue with the left coronary artery, we've got the circumflex artery. So this is a branch called the circumflex, which goes around the back. Circumflex. 
and the circumflex coronary artery you can see moves behind the heart and feeds some of the musculature behind the left hand side of the heart. Then a branch of the circumflex here is what we call the marginal artery or the left obtuse. We'll call it the left marginal artery. And you can see it goes down the margin on the left hand side of the heart, feeding the musculature of that left ventricle. Okay? So what we've got are these, for the left coronary artery, these are the three major arteries I need you to know. It's the LAD, left anterior descending, the circumflex and the left marginal. Most important point here is the LAD because it feeds most of the left hand side of the heart, most of the left musculature of the heart. It's the most important when it comes to a heart attack. If there's a blockage of the LAD, most of left hand musculature will die off, okay? And this is gonna to lead to a myocardial infarction with increased risk of death, all right? Very important. Now, if we look at the right coronary artery, let's label that, right coronary, you can see that the right coronary actually flips behind the heart as well, and you can see it moves behind the heart. But before it moved behind the heart, it had, it had another branch, and this branch is the right marginal artery. So we had a left marginal artery. Now we've got, I should probably write the correct side, right marginal artery. Here's the left marginal going down the left margin. Here's the right marginal going down the right margin, feeding the musculature of the right margin of the heart. The, left, the right coronary, which branches behind, has an important branch at the back here. This was the anterior descending. This is the posterior descending. Now you can see that the posterior descending coronary artery may join together with the left anterior descending coronary artery, and that's called an anastomosis. An anastomosis is where blood vessels join together. Okay, now this is common for us to have an anastomosis here from the posterior descending and the left anterior descending at the back of the heart. It's more common in those people who have coronary artery diseases because if there's a blockage somewhere, you wanna increase the likelihood that the whole heart gets fed, so coming together and joining is to your benefit, okay? Reduces risk of myocardial infarction. Okay, so what are the coronary arteries you need to remember? For the left-hand side, you've got the circumflex, the left marginal, and the left anterior descending. This is the most important for heart attacks. For the right coronary artery, we've got the right marginal and the posterior descending, and you may have an anastomosis at the back. So this is a quick run through of the coronary arteries.